This video documents how I teach operations management in 2022. There's uh, several ingredients to today's video. We first are going to define operations management, then what are the operations management concepts I think are the most important to cover, uh, the major themes that are woven through the course, why in this day and age operations management is more important than ever, and finally just sort of advice for students that are taking the course. So let's start with the definition of operations management. Operations management develops systems that effectively and efficiently solve problems. Right? So operations management develops systems that effectively and efficiently solve problems. This isn't the, actually the most rigorous definition, it's not the shortest definition, but I think it's a very good working definition. It actually requires a bit of effort to unpack, so let's do that. So first, operations management develops systems. Well, what's a system? A system has three components. People, who's actually going to do the work. Processes, a repeatable approach to convert inputs to outputs. And technology, resources that facilitate the work. Right? A good solution actually needs all three of these ingredients. Right? So when we're developing a system, it's not just the process, it's not just the technology, it's not just the people. All three of those are required to develop a system. Right? OM is developing a system that effectively and efficiently solves problems. Well, this could be its own discussion of sort of what's a problem. A problem is, is sort of an issue that a decision maker is faced with that they are trying to resolve. And we need to solve this problem uh, effectively and efficiently. And if this is sort of the first time you're being exposed to OM, this might seem like overly tedious, but you quickly realize it's not. So first, effectiveness requires that the system actually solve the decision maker's problem. So let's actually step back and think about this for a second again. The bar is, did we actually solve the decision maker's problem, right? An effective solution does that. An efficient solution properly allocates resources to solve that problem. If you think back, you can think of cases where, you know, you might have done something sort of, it, it produced an effective result, but it was inefficient, right? So we might, solve the decision maker's problem totally spot on, but it's very expensive to solve the problem the way we did. It's either computationally expensive or resource intensive. So that's not sort of the best solution we could have delivered. Alternatively, we can think of solutions that are highly efficient. Any question you ask me, I'm like, the answer is seven. Right? That's highly efficient, but it is not very effective to actually you know, meet what the decision maker wanted. So we need both of those. The first ingredient in our journey to develop these systems is often to build a model. And so we're going to create that model as sort of our first step in this journey. This isn't a uh, video on modeling, although that would be awesome too. This is on operations, but we have to have this digression because it's so critical. So a model is a mathematical representation of the system, of the people, process, and technology, right? So all of those ingredients. It's a mathematical representation. A good model, as we're going to see in this course, has three attributes. The first is that it is the narrowest scope, that the model begins and ends, sort of where we bound it, is as small as possible, right? That it is the coarsest granularity, that it is high, as high a level as we are willing, of sort of coarse granularity, that we will tolerate. And that it is the most focused intent, focused on exactly what the decision maker wants to solve. We will see in this course over and over again, those three ingredients are critical to creating a good model. And this course really is about model building. I mean, it's applied to operations, but it is really about model building. Why? Well, it turns out that most people have good intentions, but they are create very bad models. They create models that are the exact opposite of this. Their models are the broadest scope, right, sort of the the sort of largest sort of beginning and end sort of on how the models are defined. That they are the finest detail, like as detailed as you can get these models to be, with the widest uh, applicability. That you don't just solve the decision maker's problem, but all sorts of other problems too. Why people do that is because they do have good intentions and they want to create this flexibility that allows this model to then morph into other things. Don't do that. What we want is the exact opposite. What we want is the narrowest scope, sort of where the model begins and ends. 
the coarsest granularity, as, as granular as we're willing to allow, so as high levels we're willing to allow, with focused intent. That is what our goal is in modeling. And what this course really does is create a, a series of building block models that can be used uh, as is or could be sort of built on top of one another or augmented to solve real supply chain problems. Again, much more on this to come. OM concepts that we're going to cover in this course. Well, the first is process analysis. This is actually, to me, sort of the, the, where we begin the course because I think it's really the most critical concept to learn. It's how do we convert inputs to outputs. We're also going to look at quality. How do we produce output that meets customer expectations? And supply chain management, how do we coordinate financial information and material flows? Again, this is an introductory course, so we can't cover all of these in equal detail. And we'll spend sort of the majority of the course on uh, process analysis and on supply chain. Uh, but we're going to see many different variants of these different models. That's why it's going to be awesome. And, and so you'll get to see sort of many different kinds so you can build your modeling intuition along the way. The way the course is structured is that the actual sort of technical content of the course is presented through videos and the book chapters that we fully expect you will read before class and come prepared. And in class, we will, uh, we will analyze cases that, again, you'll have been sort of provided with beforehand. There's going to be some link on the, uh, on the case method video I've produced but to give you a sense of how that works. But in class, we'll do cases, the technical content you'll prepare beforehand. It's going to be great. The major themes that are woven through the course. Well, the first is that capacity, inventory, and information are substitutes. That Whenever you go into any place, <laughs> in a store or whatever, or factory, and you see inventory, what you know is that was capacity consumed in a previous period. That doesn't mean it's good or bad. That just means like whenever you see an inventory of something, like you know, this pet or something, whenever you see that, you know that that was inventory, that, sorry, that was capacity that was consumed in a previous period to make that inventory that is there today. So there is a very direct relationship between inventory and capacity. In another way, what information allows you to do is actually dial in the appropriate amount of capacity and inventory required. So much more to see on that, but those are some really sort of major fundamental trade-offs between inventory capacity and information that we will see made in this course. Every company operates at a locally optimal solution, right? So every company is operating somewhere, and that's a locally optimal solution. Moving from that solution is hard. And this is, again, is something for us sort of new to operations is really critical to understand. If the company could move from here to here and save $5 million or produce $50 million more in revenue, they would have moved from here to here, right? There's a reason then why if, we, if our model believes that this is achievable, there's a reason why they haven't done it. And we need to understand that. So we need to understand what is preventing the move from here to here. And there could be a couple of good reasons. Uh, and we think of those sort of in terms of hard constraints and soft constraints. Some constraints can be broken. Some constraints can't be broken. So it may or may not be feasible to go from one spot to the other. Also, it might be that we need to more carefully model the transition between them. But very much what this course looks at is how to develop feasible approaches to improve performance. And that's quite tricky in practice because of the real world constraints that sort of restrict us to locally optimal solutions. For real world problems though, and this is actually very good news up here, that it turns out that the objective function is actually sort of flat around the sort of area of the optimal solution if there are multiple products, multiple time periods, multiple locations. So again, if, if it's like a real problem, if you're just looking at one item in isolation, actually that really might have a, a very sort of pronounced optimal solution. But when you look across items and you're setting, say, the inventory policy for not just one item, but multiple items, or the ordering quantity for not just one item, but multiple items, they're actually Along with the best optimal solution, there are several near optimal solutions. This turns out to be actually a very beneficial reality 
because it means that we don't have to move from here to some mythical point here, but to sort of this region. And that's going to be easier than moving to try just to one single point. Um, we're going to see in this course that companies don't do things, people at companies do things. This ties directly back to people, process, and technology. Right? We want to understand who is actually going to make this change, who's going to implement it, right? and why was it being implemented differently before. Uh, it's critical to understand that strategy is what you do, not what you say you do. So companies have lots of strategies, corporate strategy, business strategy, finance strategy, marketing strategy, purchasing strategy, operation strategy. This course very much focuses on operation strategy. But all of these different strategies have to work together. Successful companies have strategies that are internally consistent and self-reinforcing. So when we're looking at the company's operating strategy and operation strategy, we can't do that independent of their other strategies, right? So we need to be thinking about how can we create something implementable that's consistent with the other strategies that they're already developed and executing. So in this day and age, why do we still need operations management? Let's jump to the other board and talk about that. So operations management is like in the news every day <laughs> when I think about these problems, right? You, you don't have to look anywhere. You can just like open up the paper or sort of walk to a store to see the current problems in operations. You know, right now there is a, there is a, a baby formula shortage, unfortunately. And that shortage is due to a plant closure that sort of may or may not have been, had a quality problem, but the effects of that have been tremendous now. Uh, if we look at uh, ports, in particular the port of Los Angeles, uh, we see that there have been shipping delays that are now you know, extending into months uh, where you know, transit time between China and the US say would be predictably four weeks is now stretching due to these delays you know, past 12 weeks. Uh, there's been an incredible number of retailer announcements lately uh, about their inventory problems and in particular that they have the mix wrong and they have the total amount wrong. Uh, so this is due to sort of buying during COVID and, and some mistakes that have sort of now uh, are now very much sort of manifested in the supply chain uh, because now that it's at the retailers, there's nowhere for it to go other than to discount it and sell it. For years now, there's been a chip shortage problem that has in particular impacted the auto industry and, and limited growth and sales because of the unavailability of one component in the supply chain. And there's uh, across industries right now, there's a worker sort of staff shortage, right, that is also limiting the ability to produce output. So there's incredible number of, of operations challenges that we are going to address in this course. That's why it's going to be awesome. But I thought I just would take a quick second to have a trip down memory lane. And this is the Library of Factory Management. It is a six volume set that was published in 1915 but it's actually a collection of articles from the primary industrial engineering uh, journals, uh, very much practitioner oriented from 1900 to 1915. So journals that had the name like factory and system, uh, even back then, uh, it's those. And I loved like volume one, it's sort of intro begins with uh, just to sort of begin that, Dividends are the final test of good manufacturing. Whatever plans and methods have found uh, places in these volumes have passed this test. So that's definitely throwing down the gauntlet that uh, sort of this was the sort of knowledge that was built at that time. What's interesting about it is, you know, the first two volumes are on, uh, on buildings and upkeep and machinery and equipment. So very much about uh, resources and capacity. Uh, then materials and supply, purchasing, labor, uh, you know, people, operations and cost, operation strategy, 
and executive control, uh, very much about sort of decision makers and their strategies for, for making overall decisions in the company and sort of creating the control systems that can actually achieve the results that we want to achieve. If you, if you actually crack open this book, you actually see that formula is EOQ, is economic order quantity. So, so some of the concepts we knew, right, and we've known them for a long time, so why do we still then have all of these operations problems? And there's really two reasons. The first is we have to solve these problems in a dynamic setting. So conditions are changing, and as such, we need to adapt our operations playbook to change to that market condition. Super critical. The second issue that we have to recognize is that these problems really require people, process, and technology. And as such, they are not easy, right? So it's not just like set it and forget it, right? These require constant maintenance and upkeep. And the good news is that then there's always a job in this area. But that's sort of precisely why, even though we understand a lot of things, you're going to be internalizing a playbook for yourself about how you want to go solve these problems. And with that, let's uh, go to some last advice on the board. I'd like to give some advice to students taking the course. First, simplify and accelerate. This is the mantra for the course. And it actually should really be your mantra for life. Uh, easy to say, but hard to do. Solve the simple problem first, then give yourself the opportunity to solve a problem that's more complicated. Don't try to jump to the more complicated problem and get stuck and frustrated and spin your wheels, right? Simplify and accelerate. Solve the simpler problem first, always. How do you do it? Well, you do it by creating the narrowest scope problem, right? The sort of simplest scope, the least scope you are willing to tolerate, the coarsest granularity that you are willing to tolerate, the most focused intent that solves what the decision maker actually wants. Do that, you'll be in a good place. Math is actually not the barrier to solving these problems or implementing these problems in, in practice. Anyone that is watching this video can understand the math that we're going to cover in this course. Math is not the barrier. Yes, is there so, so sophisticated math in the class? Yeah, I, I think that we fit the definition, but it's all learnable. You can actually learn all of it. So don't get hung up on the math. The goal here is really to be thinking people, process, and technology. What are the ingredients to solve this problem? Uh, if by chance, one day you come to class and you're not fully prepared. I know that won't be you, but just hypothetically. And somehow we, we start cold calling that day, which again, we probably also won't do. But, you know, and someone's like, well, what's the answer to that question? You should know the answer to every operations problem. Pooling. We'll cover this a lot in class. But pooling is combining different random variables into one single stream, one pooled random variable that actually has less overall volatility. Pooling shows up everywhere in operations, also shows up in your life. It's awesome. Let's say someone else has already taken pooling. What do you do then? Communicate more. Again, communicate more. Always a good solution in life and in operations. It's sometimes sort of easier said than done, but we definitely want to be thinking about how to communicate more in the system and what that means. And that ties directly back actually to information in the capacity inventory and information are substitutes. We co-create the knowledge in this course. You're all building your own operations playbook, but we build it together. And where we're going to go in that direction, sort of in what elements we choose to include and exclude and how we choose to do it, is very much a joint co-creation. And that's why this is awesome, so enjoy the journey. Do the math you can do, uh, sort of, but recognize there's a point where math gives way to decision making, right? That the, so I like to say, like, do the math you can do, but then realize that there's a point where you stop and you take the math and you take your experience and you take your intuition and you take your knowledge and you put those together, right? The corollary to this is don't make up math, right? But it's also like, don't stop early. Like, do all the math you can do, but then recognize there's a limit to what that math can do. And that's where the other pieces come in to the solution approach. It's going to be awesome. I look forward to taking this journey with you.